NVIDIA just finished giving press uh, about a day's worth of information, and it's Architecture Day. These are common industry events for new silicon. Typically, companies will spend time going into actual technical details from the technical teams. So that'd be engineers, product managers, product developers, people of that nature. And it's less marketing driven as a keynote might be and more useful in every sense for technical media. So this information we're going through today is going to focus specifically on the product level cooling solution for the RTX 3000 cart. This is after talking with NVIDIA's thermal team and also includes a lot of our own expertise on testing uh, cooling devices and cases over the years so that we can build on the conversation where people are asking, well, how is this cooler going to really change the game? That's what we're here to answer today. Before that, this video is brought to you by us and our updated component disassembly toolkit. We first introduced the GN toolkit last year, including fully custom tooling with 100 millimeter lawn rods and ergonomic handles, custom ground down hex heads to clear small capacitors and SMDs, magnetized tips, and a high quality CRV metal for strength. Our focus is on quality with this 10 driver kit and bag, so it'll last you a long time and survive many teardowns. The toolkit sold out in a few days last time, and we haven't had stock for over a year now, but it's finally back. Updates to the toolkit include new handle molds with permanent label engravings to identify the tools, flush fit hex heads for even better PCB clearance, and a removal of all single use plastic bags from the toolkit. Buy one at store.gamersnexus.net today to help us directly and to get a high quality PC teardown toolkit. So traditionally, our reviews of Founders Edition or reference cards or Frontier Edition cards or whatever the companies want to call them have not been too favorable from a cooler standpoint. Silicon doesn't really matter. Sometimes it's really good, sometimes it's not. But ultimately, when we're talking about strictly the cooling solution, almost universally, the reference designs or Founders Edition designs from the companies have not performed too well. On NVIDIA's side, most recently, the biggest issue plaguing the company has been an approach that is so screw happy that it ends up with as many screws as it has RTX ops in its Turing series cards. So with the RTX 2060s, for example, you end up with a card that is nearly impossible to disassemble for most users if they just need to replace a fan. And that's a bad thing from a usability standpoint and an RMA standpoint. We'd imagine their RMA department just throws the cards away when they replace them because it'd be cheaper to do that than to pay someone to actually disassemble and reassemble the thing. So that's NVIDIA's past. It has obviously changed the design significantly. We have not taken one apart yet. Uh, so we don't know if the screw count has improved, but the design maybe has, and we'll reserve judgment for when we can actually thermally test the thing and benchmark it. It's entirely possible that it sucks, just like the previous ones have, but genuinely, it looks like this card is of a much more functional approach to design just by looking at the shroud alone, as in there really isn't much of one. It's almost entirely fins this time. So that's good. That's a good start, and we need to test it to learn more. But today, we're going to be focusing on the questions of uh, for example, how does the cooler on the reference design, Founders Edition design technically, how does that impact memory? How does that impact the CPU cooler? And how does it impact the case? The reason we're approaching those is because those are literal questions asked to us by our viewers. And we're going to start with the new info before we get into our analysis. The new info is from NVIDIA's Architecture Day, specifically the product segment. The analysis will be from our experience of uh, working on case reviews cooler reviews, you've likely seen them before. So new info, NVIDIA provided some interesting charts. For example, uh, it provided a computational fluid dynamics uh, model, we'll call it, of airflow within a case. And it's done many more of these models. Assuredly, some people were asking like, well, but this model doesn't account for XYZ cooler. And definitely NVIDIA has accounted for those things. But the one that they gave us that they shared was a pretty simple model of here's the GPU and here's a top exhaust fan in the case and then here's some front bottom intake. Clearly NVIDIA hasn't seen too many of our case reviews where they'd be aware that uh, intake has been replaced with glass. But if we feed the GPU with glass, it'll probably perform just as well if you ask the case companies. That's not a dig at NVIDIA though. Uh, we'll have plenty of opportunities to look into how their cooler actually performs when it's time. So. Let's talk about the new info first. In its Architecture Day deep dive, NVIDIA also gave some airtime to its product development team to talk about those card level changes. Here's one of the more interesting claims from NVIDIA's cooler team. This chart is from NVIDIA and it shows the thermal to acoustic response against what we'd assume is likely a dummy heater. NVIDIA benchmarked its 2080 and 3080 thermal solution in like for like conditions, which can only really be done well with a dummy heater solution or very expensive hand-built prototypes. NVIDIA, being the company that made the card, 
uh, can easily do either of these things relative to what media can do, but we'd assume they're dummy heaters. This is a great way to benchmark like for like conditions without invalidating the results from other differences. And it also means that Nvidia can scale its vertical axis as high as the heater will allow. That's how we would do it anyway. So rather than being confined by silicon tolerances or maybe just ignoring them, uh, Nvidia is able to show up to 100 plus degrees. In this chart, Nvidia is claiming that its 3080 solution is approximately 10 dBA quieter at 20 degrees Celsius cooler when both are noise normalized to 30 dBA. As a reminder, noise testing isn't some 3D Mark Fire Strike score. DBA or DB isn't just like a number that exists on the product. Uh, it needs to be taken at a certain distance from the product with certain microphones and a certain noise floor. And we don't know what those exact conditions are for NVIDIA. All that really matters for its chart is that they are the same for all devices, and uh, we have no reason to believe they wouldn't be. But the point of remarking this is that NVIDIA's definition of 30 dBA will be different from ours when we do a review because our test conditions are different. Uh, we do our testing in a noise floor of 26 dB, which is very low for uh, sort of, it's similar to maybe a residential suburb in the U.S. or something like that. But it is certainly not a semi-anechoic chamber or an anechoic chamber, which would allow you a, a bit more resolution in your testing, and that's probably what NVIDIA used. Separately, our testing is done at 20 inches of distance. We don't know what NVIDIA's testing distance was for its coolers, uh, but the end result is that our data will not completely align with NVIDIA's here, so we'll do our own validation is what we're getting at. A 10 dBA noise reduction at a 20 C lower dye temperature is significant if it is reproducible, and it would put this cooler in a much fiercer competition with partners. NVIDIA may finally be able to start chewing away some of its AIB partner sales, uh, and would be more cynical about it, except the company did, to its credit, open up the 3090 to AIP partners this time, whereas previous Titan class cards were not open to them. So maybe it's not going the Apple route just yet. We do expect it to try and push that direction at some point, though, because it has been trying to get better coolers uh, in a significant fashion every year. At higher noise levels, let's pick 45 dBA on this chart, it would appear that the coolers converge and the thermal delta shrinks. This is expected and is in line with our usual cooler testing for other devices. Normally, efficiency at low noise levels is significantly harder to achieve than brute force performance. That's because you start fighting with things like the static pressure performance of the fans at those reduced RPM settings, uh, especially as matched against whatever density of fins you're dealing with. If you're dealing with a higher density, looking at the uh, 3080 and 3090 renders, it appears like they're a fairly low density of fins, but there's a lot of them. Uh, they're thicker, and they also are oriented in a way which should obviously reduce impedance from uh, against the airflow. So depending on all those factors, uh, it's difficult to get efficient performance, meaning a low thermal result while also running a low noise result that is normalized against other coolers, which are perhaps less efficient. So we would expect that the, the numbers would converge as you increase the noise level of the cooler and normalize higher. Uh, that said, it is difficult to reproduce this specific task from NVIDIA because we would basically need to adapt both coolers to fit on the same card and because of the PCB differences, because you can't just take scissors to a PCB and have it still work at the end unless you're maybe Lewis Rossman, we'd have to basically build a dummy heater for it. So we'll do this our own way when the time comes. Uh, the next most interesting slide was this one on the performance per watt improvements with Ampere. NVIDIA only plotted to about 350 watts here, unfortunately. So we don't know if this trajectory will continue under overclocking scenarios. If you were to power mod your card, like we often do, then unlocking more power than vBIOS allows could be more meaningful than typically if the performance truly scales at a steeper trajectory, as this slide is implying. NVIDIA claims a 1.9x multiplier increase in performance per watt at 60 FPS for the control game scoring, with equivalent Turing requiring 240 watts to produce equivalent work uh, to Ampere at 120 watts. At least that's what NVIDIA is claiming. NVIDIA explicitly stated that Ampere can deliver more performance as power scales, and we hope to test that in overclocking live streams and competitions at launch. We will definitely be doing overclocking with this card in its stock configuration, meaning just the cooler as is. We're almost certainly going to be water cooling, uh, well, we definitely will be water cooling a, a 3080 card of some kind. We don't know which one, if it'll be FE or not. Uh, and then most importantly for this specific chart, we're gonna be taking the Founders Edition card with a liquid nitrogen pot under LN2 down to 
whatever temperature we can reach without a cold bug. So maybe minus 125 is typically where Torian was sitting for the 2080 Ti's. Uh, so we'll be testing all that stuff. It would be actually pretty exciting if it scales past 350 watts and continues some kind of trajectory other than a flat one, a relatively flat one, because that's not common. Uh, we would expect that it would flatten probably not too far after 350 watts, though. Otherwise, it's likely NVIDIA would have continued that chart. Maybe they just didn't actually test that far, but uh, that's kind of our, our read on the situation. Ultimately, though, NVIDIA has not been too friendly to overclocking, so uh, this is getting into territory where it's going to require hard mods or BIOS hacks to get further, and that'll come later. Okay, let's get into the section talking about uh, thermal considerations from your standpoint as a system builder. This is all based on a lot of experience and uh, knowledge from our team working on case and cooler reviews, Patrick on the case side, me on the cooler side, and uh, it, it is informed, but as a reminder, this is stuff that we're giving you to sort of prepare you for the launch when we start reviewing the cards with a certain set of language and test practices so that you're familiar with what we're doing, but it is not an indication of where we expect the device to actually perform thermally. However, uh, we will be giving you sort of an outline of where it makes sense. We'll just have to actually run it for the true thermal value. So as we get into this, we'd like to first start by addressing several of the viewer and reader requests for types of testing to perform in the RTX 3000 series launch. A lot of these things we've already been wanting to do, but a couple of viewers have had different ideas, approaches to the thermal testing or things they'd like to see considered for the 3000 series just because of how unique the cooler design is. Uh, we've been paying attention to that and we have a big list of things, but uh, primarily people are interested in obviously CPU thermal performance, especially with tower coolers. People are interested in memory thermal performance, and then they've been interested in the case layout configurations. So this is all stuff we have a lot of experience in, fortunately. We recently, as many of you know, spent about six months or so revamping our CPU cooler testing entirely to eliminate a lot of the issues that are present in any kind of cooler testing. We, uh, before that, collected three years of data on CPU cooler performance and learned all the many ways in which you can screw up a cooler test. And then we've also got years upon years at this point of data for case reviews, where we have now more than, I think it's 250 rows of case benchmark data in our torture test alone. And that's not counting the other six to eight or whatever it is now uh, spreadsheets for different types of tests. So we've got a lot we can work with. And our plan is to uh, leverage our existing data and just shove a 3080 in there or a 3090 and then see how the data changes based on those configurations. And there's a lot of nuance to it that we're not going to get into today. We'll save that for when the videos go up because we don't want to uh, expose too much of the methodological considerations that we've already gone through. Okay, so the first one we want to talk about is the memory. Specifically, there were comments just online in general surrounding the 3080 launch. If you look at our uh, original launch video and kind of hold end for a really long time and then control F RAM, you'll see what we're talking about here. So. People worried about the memory thermal performance because the fan on the 3080 is a pull fan. It spins backwards, pulls air through, and spits it into the memory area. And then that obviously goes into the CPU tower cooler, or whatever fans are there. We'll talk about those momentarily. Generally speaking, with normal XMP use, you don't have to worry too much about memory thermals. It's not that sensitive when you're running at these more normal clock speeds. You're at lower frequencies. Uh, looser timings, just straight XMP, especially if you're at something like 1.35 volts. There's not much to worry about. That said, it is something to still think about, especially if you do memory overclocking. And Buildzoid, as something of a, a, a recent fanaticist about memory testing, is someone we wanted to turn to to ask about what were his concerns. As an extreme overclocker with a lot of experience working on memory, what were his concerns regarding thermals as it relates to the Founders Edition cooler uh, for NVIDIA's new card. And this is obviously going to be different for cards that have different coolers. So this doesn't apply blanket across the 3000 lineup, just the Founders Edition cooler. So Buildzoid's first response, since we had to catch him up a little bit on the design of the cooler, it's all public information from Jensen's uh, keynote, but Buildzoid has been focused on the PCB at this point. His first response was WTF? That fan goes backwards? And then we clarified it. So not a promising start for the cooler, but his follow-up considerations were as follows, quote, if the fan RPM is low enough, that will very quickly upset a lot of B-Die overclocks. I set Micron's 16 gigabit Rev-B to run 5 gigahertz, 1.6 volts in a 20 degrees Celsius room. 
And Philzoid, for reference here, works on an open air bench. So that would be his ambient temperature for uh, the system too. I left the sticks running a little too long, he said, and then they needed a 1.65 volt to post. So basically that heatsink is a nightmare for RAM OCs. At XMP, most sticks should work up to around 60 degrees Celsius ambient, though normally the temp sensitivity is worse at high clocks. Anything with a 1.5 volt XMP could get upset. The 3600 C14 works just fine, even with a hairdryer sat on top of them with 60 degrees Celsius air though. So we do need to provide some context on this. Uh, Buildzoid is an extreme overclocker. His channel is called actually Hardcore Overclocking. We'll link him below. We've worked with him on a lot of our PCB analysis videos in the past. And if you've been to this channel before, you've very likely seen those videos. So to that end, Buildzoid is speaking from the standpoint of someone who does heavy, heavy memory overclocks or just heavy overclocks in general. His perspective might be a little bit different from yours as a result of that. Buildzoid was not very concerned with the configuration for normal XMP usage or for lower voltages uh, or lower clocks when working with memory. And remember, when we say the phrasing lower clocks or lower voltages here, it's relative to the source of this information. Buildzoid is often working at or around or attempting to achieve the 5000 megahertz range of frequencies for memory, which is quite high. And his voltages uh, often are in the 1.5, 1.6, 1.65 and higher. Uh, back when we did Rip LTT as a challenge, Buildzoid was helping us behind the scenes figure out basic memory overclocking and we were running those sticks at 1.9 volts at one point and even approaching 2.0. The sticks are still alive today. They've been through dozens of hours of uh, extreme benchmarking and a competitive standpoint at those voltages at relatively high frequencies and they did survive. Now that said, uh, it is easier to maintain a high overclock with a lower required voltage potentially while keeping your memory cooler. But this is strictly for an overclocking user. Uh, Buildroid also noted that errors can become more abundant at higher temperatures. So about a five degree Celsius difference, he said with his higher overclocks was enough to trip from running fine to introducing errors. And that all depends on the settings you're running for your memory. Now, all that said, anyone who's doing more extreme or serious overclocking has a few things to think about that might invalidate the concerns of this cooler. One of them, you're probably on an open air bench. And if you're not, you're still not too worried about things like noise because at this point you're doing something that's not standard. Uh, two, if you're on an open air bench or even not, you can position a fan somewhere to deal with the extra heat that's on the memory. And you might already have a fan there to make the overclocking easier if you're focusing on memory to begin with. And then three, it is very likely that you're on water, chilled water, dice, or LN2 if you're starting to do any kind of serious overclocking. And that uh, also changes the dynamics of this all because then you're not dealing with a cooler with that design. So we'll have to benchmark this. Obviously, we'll have to visit it and look in depth. We have plenty of thermocouples we can work with. Uh, we have means of visualizing airflow patterns that we can work with and there's easy ways for us to generate, well not easy to run, but there are ways we have to generate data to show how it performs. So we will check back on this, but we wanted to sort of put out there up front that if you're a 1.35 volts XMP user, you probably don't have a whole lot to worry about here. Memory is not that sensitive at the lower frequencies and voltages. One thing that will be really interesting to test is the speed of the fan. This is something we'll be doing, but that's because running at lower speeds might be fine for the GPU proper, but could cause issues elsewhere. We noticed this previously with the 20 series and 10 series cards. Coolers with large enough heat sinks to passively cool the GPU would often end up running the memory too hot or bordering on too hot because the fans were dictated by GPU temperature, not memory temperature, except in cards like the ICX line. If the RTX 3080 and 3090 right side fan is spinning at a lower RPM for noise control, uh, its heat will pool around the memory and the CPU area in a way which would be more likely to upset those heavier overclocks on memory than if it were constantly forcing air through at a higher RPM. Hopefully Nvidia has AV BIOS on the card that accounts for this and doesn't spin too slow because then even though the GPU will be fine, it's still dumping some of its heat, even if it's low load heat onto a more sensitive area of the board where it might have limited means to deal with it. Even still normal XMP usage, uh, likely not much of a concern. So if you've been following our case reviews and buying on our advice for cases, which is to focus on airflow heavily, then you're probably fine here. And again, we have hundreds of case benchmark numbers, if not thousands, once you multiply it across the whole set of charts. Uh, so you can get more info on this in our case reviews if you wanna know what to buy when considering high airflow solutions.
Next section, thermal considerations and CPU coolers as they relate to the uh, NVIDIA Founders Edition cooler. I keep on the same reference, but they've technically changed that. So let's move on to the CPU cooler discussion. We should have already shown this image by now. This is NVIDIA's CFD airflow model of its video card, uh, computational fluid dynamics. Clearly, there will be further influence from various fans and coolers positioned within the case, but this is the baseline to start from. The CPU cooler is going to have to deal with a higher ambient inlet temperature than without this card, but we want to bring up a few points for consideration. First point, once again, not every single watt of heat is going in this direction, so that's good. The card does have two fans. Some of it is exiting the case, and some of it's going through that right fan, but not all 350 watts of power is going to be dealt with through just the right fan. Uh, point number two, most GPUs have radiative heat off the backside of the card that is meaningful anyway, and we've demonstrated its impact on CPU cooler performance in the past with case reviews. Most GPUs are also exhausting some portion of their air into the case, which means two further sub points. A, if the CPU cooler was already, even with traditional designs, dealing with heat in the case from the GPU, even if it's just radiating into it from the backside of the card. Conversely to this, the CPU cooler was not dealing with heat dumped straight into the front in its fan, as coolers always have exhaust along the fin stacks. So when a GPU cooler has its exhaust along the fin stack, the fin stack is oriented either vertically, at which point some of that air goes into the motherboard and some goes into the case side panel, or it's oriented horizontally. If it's oriented horizontally, then you've got half the air or so going out the back and the rest going towards the front of the case, assuming the card is designed properly. But either way, a lot of the air will get drafted out of the rear PCIe slot covers, assuming a positive pressure setup. With a negative pressure setup or with PCIe slot covers that are sealed tight with no holes in them, it's likely to get pulled through the CPU cooler at some point instead. So if this is the scenario you're dealing with, that's not much different than what NVIDIA is doing now, it's just more to the point. We can show this in our NTXC H500 or H510 charts to illustrate the way in which a positive versus negative pressure situation performs for the GPU. Now, CPUs produce a lot less heat than GPUs these days, particularly at the wattages we're talking about here, but their clock speeds have also become contingent upon thermals, which wasn't always true. Ryzen will clock up every couple degrees, as we've shown in testing with the 3950X and 3900X, where we brought them from 80 degrees Celsius or so above zero to minus 80 degrees Celsius. For this, we plotted a frequency step every point along the way, and you can see this in our 3900X and 3950X thermal response charts uh, where frequency is changing based on the temperature. Intel TVB has also introduced thermal contingencies to boosting, but they're a lot simpler. 70 degrees Celsius is your tripwire for that one. We'll now have a lot of new scenarios to consider in our thermal testing for CPU coolers and cases, because a top-mounted radiator may suddenly be able to better leverage its soaking potential while also more efficiently exhausting the GPU's heat. For example, in our air versus liquid cooler content, we demonstrated that most CPU tower coolers, even the largest ones, will reach steady state and become fully saturated within 90 seconds or so with a 200 watt load from something similar to a 3950X when overclocked or a 10900K when stock with MCE enabled. This means that there's less room for bursty workloads, which is what most non-workstation workloads like gaming are. So to operate below the maximum TDI at steady state, it's gonna be easier to hold those lower temperatures for longer with a liquid cooler. Larger liquid coolers, as shown in our EK versus uh, Liquid Freezer 2 360 versus 360 review, can take upwards of 400 seconds to reach steady state under CPU only load conditions. Accelerate both of these with extra heat from a GPU, and suddenly the existing advantage of liquid coolers to operate at a lower temperature while maintaining noise normalization with all other tested coolers, like 35 dBA at 20 inches with a 26 dB noise floor in our tests, will become more pronounced than even now. In other words, normalized for the efficiency of the cooler by matching the noise level, soaking the extra heat load may push the larger tower coolers outside of optimal ranges in some configurations. It just depends on how close you are already to a threshold at which it becomes untenable for the cooler. This is very difficult to account for as the dynamics of every single case in cooler configuration will impact the data in major ways. So no single review or test will be able to give you a, a universal takeaway for how the NVIDIA cooler behaves uh, related to CPU or memory temperatures or otherwise. I had to get a case for the next part, but the previous point is worth repeating, which is that once again, 
you're not going to be able to take a universal constant for how this cooler performs because of how complex case and cooler reviews already are. If you start talking about testing coolers in a case, then you're really just testing how those coolers perform in that specific case. And that's going to be the same for GPUs too, but now you're compounding, how does the GPU perform in a specific case with a specific cooler? That's what people are asking for. We can do a lot of testing. We have a lot of data already. So the cool thing is we can start drawing some pretty wide sweeping extrapolations from what we can produce on the new card and our various existing data sets. But even then, you're not going to be able to cover every single scenario. So we just want to make sure people are aware of that right away. So if you see some coverage about the cooler performing extremely well or extremely poorly with regard to other system component temperatures, both could be true is kind of what we're getting at. All right, so let's like take a look at some examples. This is the Thermal Considerations Fan Positioning section now. And for this one, we've got a P500 series case from uh, Fantax. It's the A model, so it's open front for a lot of ventilation on the front, performed very well on our benchmarks. And let's talk about a few considerations you'll have to uh, look at for the GPU. So typically, what we generally recommend is avoiding, if possible, putting fans towards the front top positioning of the case if you have a tower cooler. Uh, this is going to change again based on the cooler, but almost universally for a tower cooler, if you put a fan on the top as exhaust and you've got most of your air coming from the front as intake or from the side as intake, same thing, then a lot of times what will happen, especially with a higher pressure top front fan, we'll call it, so like up here, what will happen is that will steal air before it ever hits the CPU cooler. This is pretty obvious if you think about it, but it's probably not surprising to hear that a lot of people will just sort of saturate all the fan slots on one side of the case and call it a day. That said, though, adding more fans isn't always more better. And as we've shown in the past with case reviews, uh, you start pulling air in from the front, and you really have to think about where's that air going if you're just adding fans in it with a shotgun approach. Because if you do uh, top intake, then you can really benefit the CPU cooler, but you're limiting your exhaust capabilities. You're turning it into a really positive pressure heavy setup, so that's useful for dust control and knowing where the air is going, but you might have issues getting rid of the heat too. Your component temperature is obviously never going to be below ambient. That is physically impossible unless you have an exotic cooling solution that produces some amount of power to pull the temperature down or is something else like dice, a dry ice, or a liquid nitrogen. And because you're never going to be below ambient, if your outside temperature, sorry if this is really basic for our general audience, but uh, if your outside temperature is say 21 degrees Celsius in the low 70s Fahrenheit, then your best value you'll ever get is 21C if it's outside of the case. If it's inside of the case, there's a very good chance in most cases today, except for the better thermally performing ones, that your ambient temperature is somewhere in the range of maybe 9 to 15 degrees Celsius higher that internally than it is externally. And so that's going to be your baseline, uh, your floor for performance of that component. Now you add a GPU exhausting some heat into it, not all the heat of the card, as a reminder, but some amount of heat. Uh, that, that effective ambient for the cooler inlet is going to be maybe a couple degrees higher now. We don't know exactly what that is. We need to test it and produce data on it. But let's say maybe 4 to 10 degrees higher, depending on the case. Uh, that's going to be what you'll have to consider for your, your fan positioning and your cooler orientation. Because now, getting back to the other topic, suddenly, if you have an exhaust fan positioned up here, it might not actually be worse than if you had nothing there at all, like we were talking about earlier. Now, instead of stealing cold air at the intake from the CPU cooler, it is also potentially exhausting warm air from the GPU. And it's potentially pulling in some more of whatever's coming in down here towards the CPU anyway. So the point is, there's a lot of scenarios to consider for thermal testing for these cards coming up. And uh, there is not going to be a single blanket statement you can apply for how to configure the case the best to deal with it. And also, because we don't have actual thermal data right now, genuinely we don't. It is just after NVIDIA's announcement and architecture day, so we haven't tested anything. Uh, we're not really going to try and uh, too hard think about how you should position everything. We're just putting the notes out there for what you need to be thinking about. That'll wrap us up for this one. There were a couple of other con comments we saw online, like people talking about, for example, well, but what about how this cooler will interact with the stock Intel and stock AMD coolers? Will they have trouble dealing with the extra heat or how will it impact their performance? Uh, frankly, these are like $700 and $1,400, $1,500 cards we're talking about. If you're using a stock cooler at that point, you need to stop. 
because it's causing you other issues anyway. So that's not that. That to us is an unreasonable usage scenario. Maybe for the 3070, you can start making that argument. But then you're also talking about less power in that card anyway. Uh, so that's not really something we'd worry about. Coolers will be something that uh, they they will definitely some of them will have difficulty dealing with the change in dynamics in the system. The system meaning like the actual the the uh, thermal system, the thermal dynamic system, it, it will impact how coolers handle the heat they're dealing with already. But once you start talking about coolers that can sort of barely run the CPUs that they ship with to begin with, it's just, that's not really a reasonable usage scenario to us. So we probably won't really be testing that one. We'll be testing stuff that's more reasonable for combination with it. Uh, and for anyone saying, well, but my AMD Ryzen cooler is good, you're wrong. It's not. It's not that good. It's fine, but it's not good. So get that out of the way now. Anyway, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net if you would like to pick up our freshly restocked toolkits. Uh, these have been a long time in the works. We sold out in, I don't remember, if it, it was definitely less than a week, I think, the first time. And that was about a year ago now. It's taken us a year to get these retooled with new handles and changes to some of the other parts that you can read about on the store page and get them back in. So they're in now. And a warning for you too, we're gonna be low on inventory on this one because we spent months retooling it and we ordered it at the beginning of the year when human malware was just starting to hit. So uh, manufacturing capabilities were limited at that time. So if you want one, get in there soon. But that's on store.gamersnexus.net. We'll be ordering another round as soon as, uh, as soon as we can get them in. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.